All right. Well, happy Easter, everybody, this morning. Jesus Christ is alive. He's risen. It's exciting news. Now, normally, uh, this, this sermon this morning is going to be a little bit different than I normally do on an Easter Sunday. It's not, not, not too different, but slightly different. You know, I love celebrating the fact that Christ rose again from the dead. It's awesome. I mean, and, and it never gets old. I don't care if this is, you know, every Easter we do a service where we're, where we're talking about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's always a good thing to do. I don't care if everyone expects it. It's, it's a great thing. I, lo I love remembering that the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But what I'll be teaching about today is actually why the word Easter is only found one time in the Bible, which is in Acts chapter 12. And I'm going to hopefully dispel some common myths that are out there and some disinformation out there regarding the word Easter and the celebration of Easter. Because there's a lot of people that will tell you that Easter is a pagan holiday and that Christians shouldn't be celebrating Easter and all this other stuff. And that's just false. Now, I've done plenty of my own research into this. Okay, I've looked it up for myself. I think it's important that we look up you know, especially when you're challenged about things, we want to do, and especially at this church, we care about the truth. That's why we're called Word of Truth Baptist Church. We care about what's right. We care about what's true. You know, if, if, it, if it goes against traditions, if it goes against commonly held beliefs, it doesn't matter. Okay? We're going to cling to what's true. We're going to cling to what's right. We're going to, you know, we exalt truth and we're going to seek after truth. And if, and if it makes us uncomfortable, whatever. Right, and w knowing that we have that emphasis here, look, anyone who's who knows this church even a little bit, been coming here for a little while, knows that I don't shy away from things just because it may be unpopular, just because some, it may make people mad. You know, I mean, the the world by and large hates this church. They hate what we stand for. They hate what we preach, and that doesn't bother me one bit. I mean, the world's the world. It's going to be like that. Amen. So don't think right off the bat saying that me saying that, oh, Easter is not a pagan holiday has anything to do with me fearing what people might think if I were to say Easter were pagan. Okay, it has nothing to do with that. It has nothing to do with, with me trying to justify some sin or because I like, you know, celebrating Easter, so I just don't want to accept that, it, that it's wrong. okay. That's not where this is coming from at all. Because I'll tell you what, if I found out, if I thought that, that this was just completely wrong, if we, you know, this, there's no evidence of this in Scripture, there's no, you know, I'm okay with getting rid of stuff. That's what I want to do. That's my goal. That's, that's where my heart is. I'm looking to, to get rid of stuff. And, and you know, if, it's, if, if we shouldn't be doing something, if we're making God angry, definitely, if we're sinning, let's, let's figure it out. Let's, let's find it out and, and, and prove it and, Say, yeah, well, I don't need that anymore. Amen. But I don't believe that celebrating Easter is pagan. I've spent a bunch of time even, you know, preparing for this sermon and even in the past because I've looked this up the first time I heard about it. And I've done, I've done even more research to, you know, in preparation for this sermon, trying to look up references because you read a lot of articles, a lot of stuff on the Internet. A lot of information out there. Not all good information. A lot of information out there, though. A lot of people who don't source anything, they just, they just write an article and they say this is the way it is. Easter's pagan because it is. You know, and they give all these various reasons. So other people source it. I, I spent time actually tracking back those references and sourcing them. I and you do the same thing. Look, every time I preach, no matter what the subject is, look it up for yourself and determine if what I'm saying is true. That's what the Bereans did. And that was a good thing. They were commended for that. That's something that everybody ought to be doing. And this is, there's no information I'm going to provide for you this morning that you can't verify for yourself. So do it. Take notes. That's why we have the sermon notes on the back of our bulletin here. Write, it, write down these things. Write down something you hear. You say, well, I don't know if that's right. Look it up. Look it up for yourself. What I found when I started looking up these various references, because I, you know, when, when I want to know the truth of a matter, I'll look at all sides. I try to try to see what does this person say? What is that person? What are people saying about this? I don't care if it contradicts what I what I currently believe. I'm I'm okay with challenging my beliefs. And we ought to be. 
How are you ever going to come at the truth if you're not, if you're not able to challenge? I mean, I know that I'm not perfect and I don't have all knowledge and all wisdom and I'm just, just right about everything. I know that much. If you're, if you're too proud, you're not going to be able to learn anything anyways. We need to be able to stay humble and, and be able to, to receive correction, be able to receive instruction. So this is the way that we ought to handle everything. And this is this situation, this is no different. We'll determine whether or not, well, should we be celebrating Easter? I don't know. And how we celebrate is a whole other thing. We'll get into that too. But um, what I've been able to find is a lack of anything credible when you go back to original sources. Because there's a lot of people who, who quote other people. A lot of references that go back to someone else who then references someone else who then references someone else. And when you kind of get down to the bottom of things, there's not a whole lot there. And I'll, and I'll tell you what I've found. So now, one of the things that people will, will, will claim is that, well, Easter has all these pagan roots because back in, the, in Rome, after Christianity was pretty much established, the Roman government was, was Christianizing a lot of pagan rituals, a lot of pagan celebrations, because they had taken over some areas and they're trying to convert everybody to Christianity. That's true. That happened. That's a fact. But just because those things happened, you can't just apply it across the board to everything. And also, just because they Christianized some things doesn't make all holidays pagan. And it doesn't mean that they created new pagan holidays in order to pacify people either. Like It's not, it's not like a new holiday... Um, they, they create some new pagan holiday to pass it off as Christian. So Easter's not some new, you know, we'll get, we'll get in that. I, mean, I don't want to get too far ahead of myself here. The most common misrepresentation of, of Easter and what, and what you'll see, you'll probably see it on Facebook today. You'll probably see it online. You'll see the memes that say, um, you know, something to do with Easter is, is really you're, you're worshiping Ishtar. Has anyone heard that before? I mean, something along those lines, you know, they'll bring up Ishtar. Ishtar was this Mesopotamian goddess of war, fertility, and sex. That's what, that's, those are the main things that that goddess stood for. Now, what they'll do is they'll, they'll leave out the part about, oh, she's a goddess of war, right? Because it doesn't fit the, the, the mold that they're trying to say that you're really celebrating uh, Ishtar or whatever when, when you celebrate Easter. You know, so that's where the word comes from. And they claim that the Semitic pronunciation of Ishtar, and it's, the reason I'm saying Ishtar is because it's spelled I-S-H-T-A-R. So in our, in our common way that we would, we would pronounce English words, we would say Ishtar. But they say, well, the real Semitic pronunciation of that is Easter. That, that word, and then they say that this is why, you know, this is where our word Easter came from, is from this goddess Ishtar. Now, ultimately, and again, from my research, I found out this is just a fault, what's called a false friend. It's a homophone where the words sound similar or they sound alike, but they're not the same at all. They're just completely different. We've got plenty of words like that in the English language that sound very similar, but mean two completely different things. Now, there's also a lot of other goddesses that some people also try to say Easter is named after. So they'll bring up all these various goddess, gods and goddesses to try to prove their point. Um, one of them being Eostre, and that's supposedly a German goddess. But when I looked up that one, because that's real similar in spelling and, and, and even in meaning of the, of the name, the Eostre, when you look that up, and you'll find this to be true, there's only one reference to the existence of this German goddess. And it was a British historian named Bede in the 8th century. There is no other writings. There is no other recordings at all of anybody worshiping or, you know, even knowing about this German goddess, Eostre, than one person. When you boil it down, there's one source of information that, that this is even a real thing, that this, this even exists. Now, does that make it false? No, but when you're considering whether or not something's true, I mean... You've got one witness. You've got one testimony. You've got one person that very easily could have, could have just made it up. What were the motivations? I don't know. I mean, he lived in the 8th century. 
You could have, who knows? And this is, this is why it's important too. I mean, any, anything that you're reading, you know, just because someone wrote something down in a book doesn't make it right. I could write whatever I want down in a book. And just because it's old doesn't make it accurate either. There's a lot of newspapers today that aren't printing very accurate information about what's really happening in the world. That if you were to find them in a couple hundred years from now, you'd have no idea if it's true or not. We need to keep that in mind. And that's why we, you know, ultimately, and what, what I'm going to do with this sermon, you'll see, I'm going to use the Bible to prove that, that there's nothing wrong with the word Easter. And you're going to see, when you, when you see how the word was used and where it came from, it's, it, you know, we know, we know that God's word is true. We, we know that this is true. We, we don't have to, to second guess this, this word. This is, this is fact. And it's very old, but we know that God is the one that promised to preserve his word for us today. So any other piece of information, things that we read, we could be skeptical about those things and we should be skeptical about those things. But when it comes to God's word, we know that God's word is a fact that's proven to us. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, hopefully you're resting in his written word. You're hopefully resting in God's word. So um, anyways, continuing on here, I don't want to bore you with too much of this stuff either. I, I did some of the research on it, but basically the, East, the etymology of Easter it's not 100% settled. People argue about this. Okay, you'll find people that have different opinions. And you'll find people that say, well, the, the, the word Easter came from this Eostre, this German goddess, which is completely different than Ishtar, by the way. Because what, what happens is people try to say this is pagan. They'll say, oh, this is Ishtar. Oh, but, but that's not where the name came from. Oh, well, it's Eostre. It's this other guy. You know, and they kind of move the goalposts as far as trying to prove that, that this is pagan. So, oh, well, this is this. And then you say, well, yeah, but there's only one person who ever even mentioned anything about that who you have no idea how they worship. You have no idea if they, you know, and, and they throw in the, the bunnies and the, and the eggs and everything else and saying this is how they worshiped when the fact is they don't really know. So there's some people that will say that Easter, the word, came from this Yastre. Now, I mean, we know English is a Germanic language, first of all, if you don't know that. If you weren't aware of that, you know, the English hasn't been around forever. People haven't been speaking the English language forever. There's a lot of languages that exist today that never existed in the time of Christ and prior to that. But they stem from other languages. So the language that we speak today stemmed from a Germanic language. And there's many other languages that, that all kind of had that same source. And, you know, people move away of these nations and, and, and the, uh, the dialects and languages change over years. Um, but the German word for Easter is Oster, O-S-T-E-R. And, and, and forgive me if I'm not pronouncing all these words correctly, but... Um, and that stems from Ost, which means the rising of the sun or the east, which makes sense. I mean, Easter, the name East is in Easter. And the whole point is that it's referring to the rising of the sun. And it's describing basically the resurrection of Jesus Christ, which is the rising of the son of God, right, from the dead. It's a, it's a rising. And that's literally, the, the, you know, the closest thing, it, it's rooted in that definition, which is why the word Easter is used and has always been used to, to um, identify or um, label the resurrection. The holiday specifically that is celebrated for the resurrection. Now, that's the, the etymology. And if you're interested in that, you can, you can look up more of that for yourself. But that etymology doesn't really matter as much. We're going to look at Easter in practice. It's clear that the resurrection of Jesus Christ has always been celebrated since the resurrection of Christ. This is something that we could see from biblical examples. This is also something that we can see just from historical examples. Now, I'm not one to go to the Catholics or the Council of Nicaea or all these other places to prove my doctrine, but just to prove that it's been used in that sense, and that Christians, you know, even so, whether the real Christians, so-called Christians, Christianity in general at large has been celebrating the resurrection of Jesus Christ and identifying when to celebrate that going all the way back. It's, it's, it's historical fact that it's going back at least to the year 325 at the Council of Nicaea and before that, because the council, that one of the things that they talked about there was what day do we celebrate Easter? trying to figure out when, when should we be doing this. And that's when it was determined that 
that we, you know, because the Christians were believing some different things. I mean, people were celebrating on different days, whatever, right? They thought that was a problem. They're trying to unify everybody. Let's all celebrate on the same day. So what, one of the things that they did was they determined, you know, and, and it makes sense what they determined too, is the Sunday after the beginning of Passover, and it had to be at least one day after Passover, which if you were here last Wednesday, it makes perfect sense where we, we talked about all the various dates. I mean, when Jesus Christ was crucified, he was crucified on the Passover because he was a Passover lamb for us. And why would you celebrate the resurrection on the day that he was supposedly crucified, right? So it makes sense that it has to be after that. But they chose the first Sunday as the time to do that because he was risen the first day of the week, according to the scripture. So, I mean, it makes perfect sense why they determined that day. Now, you may like a different day. You want to do it on, you know, that's not the point. The point is that they were celebrating this day and they wanted to nail down the day that they wanted to, to celebrate it on all the way back in the fourth century three to and, and prior to that and we're going to see here as soon as we get back to the bible because i'm just kind of laying a little bit of groundwork here before we get back into scripture that this is exactly what's being referred to here in acts chapter 12 because there's a lot of people you know good people that believe that hey kjv is the word of god i believe every word of this bible to be true i you know and and they see that word Easter, and in order to try to reconcile it, they say, well, wait a minute, why does it say Easter here? I thought Easter was a pagan holiday. So they say, well, that was Herod, and Herod is celebrating this pagan holiday called Easter, and that's what he was waiting for to end. But it, that, I'm going to prove that to you in just a second, that that is just completely false. That is 100% false. It's not a matter of opinion. That's just false. And if you know anything about the translation of the Bible and, and the work that went into it, um, and again, we believe, I, I believe that you don't have to go back to the Greek for any reason. We have a perfectly preserved word of God for us today in the English language. We don't have to go back and, and figure out, well, what does this Greek word mean? Well, it means what the English says. That's what it means. Because God preserved his word for us today. That's what we have. And what you'll find when you go back to the Greek is that it's always going to match up every time. But one of the things that's interesting here, and this is the reason why I'm even just bringing this up is because so many people get confused about this issue with Easter and why is it used and where is it used. And it's actually, it, it, when we get to the end of this, you're gonna, it, it makes perfect sense why it's used only one time. If you're familiar with how the Bible was translated into English, you're familiar with a man named William Tyndale. Okay, he, he did a lot of work. He, could, he translated the entire New Testament into English and the, the first five books of the Old Testament in English. And the King James Bible really isn't a brand new translation at all. It's actually a revision. There's works that have been done prior to the King James Version being written down that were used as sources to, to, make, to, to make better, to make it, you know, because none of the versions were perfect. One of the things about Tyndale, though, He's actually the one responsible for putting the words Easter and Passover into the English Bible. Previously, these words, you know, the word for, for Passover, he's the one, he, he actually created the word Passover. It used to be transliterated, which means that they, they didn't have a good English word. There wasn't an English word that existed that would represent the same meaning of the Greek or the Hebrew word that was being used. So they, what they would do is say, well, we don't have an exact translation for this, so we're just going to keep this word and, and, and just make a new English word with this transliteration and that people just have to learn that that's what this word means. Okay? But what Tyndale did is he created this word Passover because it does represent what that word means. So the Greek word is, and, and again, I'm, I'm probably not going to be pronouncing this right, it's, you know, pesca or pesha and uh, pasca. And then um, in Hebrew, it's, it's, you know, it's the Hebrew version of, of the Greek, right? So he created Passover because what it is, it's when the, the, the Passover lamb, when, the, when, God was, when God was leading the children of Israel out of Egypt, the last plague was that the firstborn son was going to die in every household unless 
You, you killed the lamb and put, and put the blood on your doorposts of your house. When you do that, obviously there's a lot of symbolism. We're not going to get into all that. I went into that a little bit on Wednesday. The, of, the, of being covered by the blood. God sees the blood and the angel's going to pass over that house and you're not, you, you know, not going to be afflicted by that plague. You're not going to lose your firstborn son because he passed over. So this was the time, this was the, the, the Passover lamb was slain for, that, for God to pass over. That's what that word means. Now, Tyndale made that word up. It makes sense. It's actually pretty neat the way it is because it's very similar to the word Pascha. Or, you know, it, it's very similar in, in the spelling and the sound, but it actually represents the meaning as well. Now, that was in the early 1500s. He, um, it took a little bit of time for people to accept and say, yeah, that is a good word and be accepted at large by, by the community, right? I mean, you can't, you know, people make up words. You can make up whatever word you want. And if it's no good, it's going to be rejected, right? So when he translated the, uh, he used that word Passover, he actually used the word Easter synonymously with the Jewish Passover and not some pagan holiday. When he did his translation work, there's the same exact Greek word was used in the New Testament. Sometimes he would use Passover. Sometimes he would use Easter. And they met, they're referring to the same exact thing. He's interchanging this word. I'm going to give you some examples here. I looked at a facsimile of the Tyndale Bible. I have the verses here, and I, and I forget how many times he used it, maybe 14 times in the New Testament he used the word Easter. I've got a few of them here. So like in Matthew 26, 2, the Tyndale Bible reads, Ye know that after two days shall be Easter, and the Son of Man shall be delivered to be crucified. Matthew 26, 18 says, And he said, Go into the city unto such a man, and say to him, the master saith, my time is at hand. I will keep mine Easter at thy house with my disciples. Mark 14, 1. And turn if you would to Mark 14. Turn if you would to Mark 14. Mark 14, verse 1 says, after two days, and this is all the Tyndale Bible. I'm reading from the Tyndale Bible. After two days followed Easter and the days of sweet bread or unleavened bread. And the, the high priests and the scribes sought means how they might take him by craft and put him to death. Now, Mark 14, 12 proves that he used Passover and Easter synonymously. I mean, other than the fact that we can see all these places he's using the word Easter in our King James Bible, it's using the word Passover. Okay. Mark 14, 12 in the Tyndale Bible says, And the first day of sweet bread, when men offer ye... Pascal lamb, which is that transliterated word for Passover, the Pascal lamb, his disciples said unto him, Where wilt thou that we go and prepare that thou mayest eat the Easter lamb? So in the same verse, the same context, he's talking about the Pascal lamb and the Easter lamb and, and using them interchangeably, referring to the same exact thing. And like I said, the underlying Greek words are the same for all of these. And even in Acts 12, where we started out, that word Easter has the same underlying Greek word. It's exactly the same thing. So if it's referring to a completely separate holiday, if it's referring to a completely separate day, then that would mean that if you believe that the KJV is inerrant, it's right, it's the word of God, that this is like some new revelation that was given that Herod was celebrating, some pagan, waiting for some pagan holiday to end and not what everybody else in history prior to 1611 believed to be the Passover, to that time of year, okay, the Easter. That they, they was literally talking about the Jews' celebration, and that's what he was waiting for. Um, or the Christian, you know, the, the, the Christian, the, the Christ-believing Jews, right? It's the same time of year because the, the, you know, Easter is the same time of year as a Passover, right? It's just the, the Christ we recognize as Christians as Christ fulfilling the Passover and his resurrection from the dead, which happens during the same time of that Passover week 
of the, the Passover and then the Feast of Unleavened Bread that followed it. So if this was some pagan holiday, why did Tyndale use it all the time? It was obviously a word that was known in English to represent a Christian holiday. That's exactly what it meant. And that's going all the way back to the 1500s. Now, the KJV, as I mentioned before, relied much on Tyndale's work. So why did only one reference to Easter remain? Because he used it many times. And then you look at other versions prior to the KJV and after Tyndale, they would start using Passover more and removing Easter, but not completely. And, and it kind of dwindled down to where we have the KJV, which the KJV, I think, now is the only version that has the word Easter in the, as far as modern translations go. I think all the modern translations now have changed this. But the KJV is right. And the KJV, is, though it's not right because it's referring to a pagan holiday. Because it's not. That's not what it's talking about. It, 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 you know, the pagan holiday didn't exist. It wasn't even being celebrated. The Greek work it is the same. That's why I mentioned. The KJV did not bring new knowledge that was not previously known. And it is, however, a correct translation and is proper to use that one time because Easter refers to the holiday celebrating the resurrection. All the other New Testament reference still, prefer, still referred to the Passover prior to the resurrection. So when, uh, when Tyndale translated his, his New Testament, he used the word Easter a lot. When he went back and started to do the, the Old Testament, the first five books of the Bible, he he realized, well, I can't use Easter in the Old Testament because that is the celebration. It's not exactly the same thing. Easter is not the same thing as the Passover. Easter is Christ's fulfillment and his resurrection from the dead after Passover. So it's not the same thing. I mean, he, he's fulfilling it. There's so much you know, overlap involved there, but it's not the same exact holiday. So he realized, like, I can't, I can't use this word in the Old Testament. And that's when he came up with the word Passover because he needed a different word in the Old Testament. So what we have here then in the New Testament is, you know, and, and the way that they were really, the words were being used. You say, well, in the New Testament, it's a Christian thing. So we're using the word Easter. But actually, the reason why the King James only has it used in one place is because all of the other references to the Passover are still referring to the Old Testament celebration of the Passover in the context of when is the event taking place. So when they're referring to, you know, just because the word Passover exists in the New Testament doesn't mean that it's referring to something that happened after the resurrection of Christ. The one time it's referring to, to an event that happened after the resurrection of Christ is found in Acts chapter 12. Because in Acts chapter 12, Jesus Christ is already risen from the dead. And this is a current event that's happening in that time after the resurrection of Christ, referring to a holiday that was going on at that time. And in Acts chapter 12, it makes it very clear. Verse number 3 of Acts 12, if you want to go back there, this is where we find it. It says, And because he saw it pleased the Jews... And all these politicians back then, Herod, you know, all the people that were ruling, they were your typical politician that only cared about what, you know, like, well, what, what do the people want? What's going to get me the most votes? You know, I, oh, the Jews, they're a very significant portion of the, you know, the, uh, the, the realm here, and I'm going to try to make them happy as a politician, so I'm going to do things that are just going to please them, right? And, and these are the Jews that, that hated the Christians, that hated Christ, that crucified Jesus. So there, that's when he's going after and, and allowing the, the persecution of the Christians. So in verse 3 of Acts 12, it says, And because he saw it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to take Peter also. So okay, it makes them happy, we'll arrest Peter. Then were the days of unleavened bread. So it's a, that's a parenthetical statement there, tell, letting us know exactly the time. This is, these are the days of unleavened bread. And when he had apprehended him, he put him in prison and delivered him to four quaternions of the soldiers to keep him, intending after Easter to bring him forth to the people. It's obvious, the verse right before, he's saying, well, th these were the times of unleavened bread. This is a time of Jewish celebration. He's pleasing the Jews. And he's intending, he's saying, you know what, I I'm going to arrest him, but then we'll bring him forth after Easter. 
because that's going to be the, the, the best time now where it's not going to step on anybody's toes uh, that are celebrating during this feast of unleavened bread. And he says it's after Easter. And Easter, again, is referring to the event, the Passover event, after the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And that's the only time we're going to find that in the King James Bible, and it's accurate. And, it, and that's the reason for doing it. Now, I'm not, I don't think that using the word Passover is inaccurate there. I just think it's a better usage of the word. Because that's the same word. It's just, it's, it, it, the, the point is that they're synonymous and they've always been used synonymously as the meaning of the word. From people going all the way back to the 1500s and, and when English was still in its early stages of, of what we even call modern English today. So the word being used. And it was derived from this German word, again, from the East, and I went into all of that. Now, there is and always has been attack on Christianity and its validity. Always has been. The argument has been around for a long time that Christian, you know, Christianity is a ripoff of older religions. Right? That's one of the, one of the complaints I hear. People say, oh, well, you, you know, Christianity just uses all these pagan, uh, you know, people did that before, right? Thousands of years before, there were people that worshipped these other gods, and they had their saviors, and they had their person that came back from the dead, and, they, you know, and, and they're saying, what's the difference about Christianity? All these other religions had the same thing. And they'll say they're older. Now, we know right off the bat that that's a lie. And what people, I think, get confused about is that, yeah, it's called Christianity after Christ, but the actual religion is the same religion. You go back to you know, the Jews' religion, that the ones that were believers that actually believed in the Lord, they knew that a savior was coming. They knew that there was a Messiah coming, which is, again, it's provable from scripture. They were waiting for a Messiah. They were looking for the signs. They were saying, when is our Messiah going to come? And then he came, and his name was Jesus Christ. And after he came and died on the cross and rose again from the dead, people started be call being called Christians. But there are people who had the same faith, the same belief, it was just revealed more to them after the fact. Oh, okay, now, now we realize who it is. This is the Savior. This is what he said. Amen. But it's not a different religion. Right. Bible says in Romans 4, even as Abraham believed God and it was counted in for righteousness. Salvation has always been the same. Abraham believed the Lord. God is the same. It's the same God. It's the same Godhead. Jesus Christ existed in eternity past. He came to this earth at a specific time, but he's always existed. It's always been the same religion going back to Adam and Eve. So if you're going to say that there's a religion older than the Bible religion, it's a better way of putting it because Christianity, it's, you know, people have this start date of 2,000 years ago. But that's not the start date. That's, you know, the Bible religion goes all the way back to creation. Amen. So we have a religion here that has been around longer and older than any other religion. You know, the Hindus like to claim that their religion is right because it's the oldest. And we know that that's a lie. The attacks are expected from the unbelievers, but we don't need believers attacking, attacking a Christian holiday and calling it pagan. The word Easter does not come from Ishtar and it's not a pagan holiday. Now, that being said, it doesn't mean that the way everyone celebrates Easter is right. It doesn't make it all correct. So just like Christmas, it's not about Santa Claus, Right? And it's not right to lie to your children about a fictional character that sees you when you're sleeping, that knows when you're awake, that knows when you've done bad, that knows when you've done good, and all these various godlike features that this Santa Claus, this fictional creature has, that you lie to your children about and say, oh, he's going to come in, he's going to leave you presents, and you better be good because he's watching you, right? And you say things like that to them and they grow up and find out, oh, that was just a big fat lie. But then you're saying, oh, yeah, no, no, but, but Jesus is real. I know you can't see him. God's real. I know you can't see him, but he actually can see what you're doing and, and, and you, know, you ought to be good because God's watching you. There's a lot of damage there. That's not right. And you all know, preach against that. I don't, think, I don't think people should be doing that. But it doesn't make Christmas wrong because people are doing things that they shouldn't be doing. Maybe they're deceived, they're, you know, they're, they're celebrating in ways that they don't realize. I mean, the Easter Bunny, I don't think the Easter Bunny's right. I don't see anything about the Easter Bunny 
this has to do with Easter. Again, another creature, which, which the, the story isn't quite as good with the Easter Bunny. I never really got the exact details on how the Easter Bunny like leaves a basket of, of candy at your house. I don't know. But, you know, so, so there's things that we need to be aware of. We need to be looking at and say, this, you know, this has nothing to do with the holiday. But even if it has nothing to do with the holiday, it doesn't make it necessarily sinful, right? What is sinful is making up a creature and lying to your kids and saying that it's like God. I, I think that's a sin. I don't think, I don't think people should be doing that. I actually go as far as to say, that is sinful. You shouldn't be doing that. That is wrong. And I think it makes God angry when we do that. But other things that people do, is it really a sin? I mean, I think about like, like coloring eggs. Now, do eggs have anything to do with Easter in the Bible? No. But you know what they are? They're a symbol. I mean, people use it. This is where the tradition even came from. It's a symbol, symbolizing new birth, new life. Now, new birth and new life is not some complicated concept, right? Just because some pagans also celebrate new birth and new life in the springtime doesn't mean that, well, they've got, they've got everything, the whole market cornered on anything that symbolizes new birth and new life. That's ridiculous. There's nothing wrong. I don't think there's anything wrong. There's nothing simple. There's nothing against God that's saying if you color an egg, you're, you're in sin. We see traditions all throughout the Bible. And one of the things we need to, to remember about traditions is that sometimes they could be good. Sometimes they could be bad. Sometimes they could just be neutral. I mean, really, there's, there's not anything wrong. We have a lot of things that we celebrate today. Like, think about, um, turn if you would to uh, Mark chapter 7. Turn if you would to Mark chapter 7. We have tradition in this country. We have holidays that we celebrate that have nothing to do with the Bible. Independence Day, the 4th of July, right? Big tradition, 4th of July, blow off some fireworks. Why do, why do people do that? It's in remembrance of a battle, of a war, right? The fireworks go up. It's like the bombs exploding, you know, and, and, and the, the war that was fought for independence. There's a meaning behind those traditions. It has nothing to do with the Bible, but it doesn't make it sinful either. I mean, if you're not doing anything that's contradicting God's word, you're not sinning. Now, you also don't have to celebrate that. And Easter is another holiday. Easter is not in the Bible. It says you have to, you know what is in the Bible is remembering the Lord's Supper. We did do that. And that is something we should be doing because that was ordained of God that we should be remembering that and doing that. Easter is not. You don't want to celebrate Easter? Don't. I don't care. That's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. I'm not going to judge you. I'm not going to hold that over your head. I'm not going to think you're less of a Christian if you don't celebrate Easter. But don't lie to me and tell me that Easter is a pagan holiday because it's not. It's gone all the way back through history showing that Easter is a, a, a holiday that's celebrated by Christians. And for the right reason, nobody is going and, and, and doing anything to some weird goddess that no one's ever heard of. They're celebrating the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And just like, you know, there's other traditions, there's other things that we do, it doesn't make it sinful. I'm going to read for you a couple of, of times the Bible talks about traditions that are good things. Okay, I'll read this for you in Mark 7. Stay there. 2 Thessalonians 2.15 says, Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which ye have been taught, whether by word or our epistle. Those are good traditions. He's saying, hold those, hold those traditions. We taught you these traditions. We want you to keep doing them. They're good things. 2 Thessalonians 3.6 says, Now we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus, that you withdraw yourselves from every brother that walketh disorderly, and not after the tradition which he received of us. So in the tradition that we gave you, those are good things. Keep following those. Those are good traditions. In Mark 7, we're going to see some bad traditions. Mark 7, verse 5 says, Then the Pharisees and scribes asked him, Why walk not thy disciples according to the tradition of the elders, but eat bread with unwashed hands? He answered and said unto them, Well hath Isaiah prophesied of you hypocrites, as it is written, this people honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Howbeit in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. For laying aside the commandment of God, ye hold the tradition of men, 
as the washing of pots and many other such like things ye do. And he said unto them, Full well ye reject the commandment of God that ye may keep your own tradition. For Moses said, Honor thy father and thy mother, and whoso curse a father or mother, let him die the death. But ye say, If a man shall say to his father or mother, It is Corban, that is to say, a gift, by whatsoever thou mightest be profited by me, he shall be free. And ye, sh and ye suffer him no more to do aught for his father or his mother, making the word of God of none effect through your tradition which ye have delivered, and many such like things do ye. So in that first verse that we read there, verse number five, the Pharisees are, are worried about the disciples not following certain traditions. Right? They're saying, they're going to Jesus, well, how come, your, how come your disciples aren't following these traditions? Huh? But see, their traditions weren't commandments from God. So who cares if they weren't following their traditions? Doesn't matter. They're free to do that. But what Jesus rebukes them and says, you know what? You're the ones with the problems because you have traditions which are replacing the commandments of God. You've come up with your own rulings, with your own teachings, and they're superseding what God has given you. That's when you know a tradition's bad. When you're going to follow some commandments of men and replace that with the word of God, now you're in very serious territory when it comes to bad traditions. So not all traditions are good, but not all traditions are bad. Okay? You want to follow some traditions? Fine. And I think the key is knowing when traditions contradict the Word of God. As I mentioned before, like lying, right? You're lying to someone in order to keep a tradition. God, the Bible says not to bear false witness. Now you're saying that, well, this is our tradition. We have to keep doing this. No, no, no. Why don't you listen to what God said first and make sure whatever traditions you're going to follow aren't contradicting God's word. So when it comes, and there's various things that people do, you know, uh, eating a ham, uh, whatever. There, there's, there's all kinds of different things. And, and what I would say is that look those things up for yourself and decide, Am I, am I sinning by doing any of these things? And if you are, don't do it. For right off the bat. If I think this is a sin, don't do it. Also, if you have a problem in your heart with something that you think might be a sin and you're not too sure, don't do it. Because the Bible also says that if, you think, if, you're, if you're not doing it on faith, if you think that something is a sin, even if it's not a sin, if you think something's a sin and you do it, in God's eyes, that is a sin. Even though it's not breaking God's law. It, it, because it's where your heart is. Because God's looking at your heart and saying, wait a minute, you think you're sinning and you're doing it anyways. That's a sin. So if you think, and look, if, if what I've already showed you this morning doesn't convince you, if, you've ever, if you had a doubt saying, well, I think Easter might be a pagan holiday and I don't think we should be celebrating Easter. And, and if I didn't convince you of that, and you think, you know what, no, this still isn't right, I still, you know, then don't celebrate Easter. Please don't. I mean, don't do it. Because then you're going to be sinning against God. Why take the chance? And I'm all for, I mean, we should be careful in the way that we approach our faith and how we do things. I have this settled already. I don't think there's a, you know, we went on an Easter egg hunt yesterday. We did. I brought my kids to one. I don't think there's anything wrong with that at all. I have no problem saying that. It's settled in my heart. I don't think it's a sin. They know what Easter's all about. It's fun for them to run around and get these little eggs and get some candy. That's, that's, the eggs have nothing to do with Jesus. They sell it, we, we tell them that, uh, you know, eggs are a symbol of new life. This is a tradition that's, that's been done for a long time. And, um, you know, I, I don't see a problem with it. That's where I stand. But I'll let you know that. I'm not going to hide anything from you. But you need to decide for yourself what you think is right. But I, I mean, I if you could show me that where, where that's a sin, of letting my kids get an Easter egg and, and, and open up the candy inside, by all means, I'll listen to you. I don't think you're going to convince me, but I mean, I'll listen to you if you've got some evidence. I don't, I don't see that as being a sin, and I don't, and I don't see anywhere where that is a pagan where, where they're doing pagan things by picking up eggs on the ground. But whatever. You know, people are going to, I already know right now, there's going to be people that get really upset about this sermon on the internet. I don't care because there's all kinds of disinfo on the internet anyways. It doesn't matter to me. 
But I get, I get kind of upset and I get angry when you get people who are believers and believe in Christ and they want to just shut down all holidays like they're a Jehovah's Witness or something. I mean, seriously, this is, Christmas and Easter are like the two times of year in our wicked, dark, perverted culture where people will still talk about Jesus Christ. And it's still a good thing. And it's still somewhat accepted to say, praise God, glory to Jesus Christ. And I, I, at that Easter egg hunt we were yesterday, I don't know how many times we heard, God bless you, praise God, hallelujah, things like that. Why? Because they weren't celebrating some goddess. They were celebrating the resurrection of Christ, which is why people were there in the first place. And it got people out and talking about it. And I think that's a good thing. And I don't see anything wrong, like I said, I don't see anything wrong in the way that, that things are being done. It's just some tradition, some stupid tradition. Okay? It's what it is. Where are we at? Let's see. I got, I got one more reference for you. Turn, if you would, to Joshua 22. We've got a little bit of time. We've got one more, one more reference in Joshua 22. Because traditions are introduced to help reinforce some teaching for generations to come. And we see examples of traditions in the Bible that were not, you know, spoken by God for, them, for, for his children to have, but were also not condemned at all. In no way. That is not a problem. So holding traditions that are not dictated by God does not mean you're automatically doing something wrong or bad. In Joshua 22, this is the end of the, basically at the end of the book of Joshua, children of Israel, you know, they come in, they had conquered, and they were distributed their land and said, okay, here's where you're going to, you know, all the various tribes are going to be. And you had the tribe of um, Manasseh and, you know, in, uh, in um, Reuben, half the tribe of Manasseh and Gad in, the, in that lower, in the, in the part on the other side of the river. Well, let's just, let's pick up a reading. I'm not going to explain it. Let's let the Bible do the explaining here. Verse number 21. The Bible says, Then the children of Reuben and the children of Gad and the half tribe of Manasseh answered and said unto the heads of the thousands of Israel, The Lord God of gods, the Lord God of gods, know, he knoweth, and Israel he shall know. If it be in rebellion or if in transgression against the Lord, save us not this day, that we have built us an altar to turn from following the Lord, or if to offer thereon burnt offering or meat offering, or if to offer peace offerings thereon, let the Lord himself require it. And if we have not rather done it for fear of this thing, saying in time to come, your children might speak unto our children, saying, what have ye to do with the Lord God of Israel? So what they had done was they, they erected this altar on their side of the river. Now, the place where the Lord's name was, was, was had and where they were going to have the burnt offerings and the sacrifices was already established. And it wasn't in their land. So the rest of the children of Israel, they saw this altar thing and, whoa, what, you know, like, what are you guys doing? Like, you can't be setting up your own altar here to burn sacrifices and stuff because it's over here. He said, do you remember what God did with Achan, the guy that just stole, you know, a few garments and some silver and how many people lost their lives? So they were ready to like, to, to militarily just go in and like, like you need to correct this right now or else we're going to, we're going to correct it for you. Because they thought that they were just kind of establishing their own place to worship God and they were going to have none, nothing of it. But what they explained there, say, well, wait a minute. We're not, they're saying, God forbid that we would actually build an altar here in order to offer up sacrifices and stuff. So that's not what we're doing at all. And they explain what they're doing. And see, there's no commandment not to build this altar. And what they're doing is they said, what we're concerned about is that in the future, your children are going to say to our children, you know, who do you think you are? What, what rights have you to worship God? You know, you're over there, we're over here, we're in the promised land, you're not. So what he says is that, um, it says in verse 25, it says, For the Lord hath made Jordan a border between us and you, ye children of Reuben and children of Gad, you have no part in the Lord. So shall your children make our children cease from fearing the Lord. Therefore we said, let us now prepare to build us an altar, not for burnt offering nor for sacrifice, but that it may be a witness between us and you and our generations after us that we might do the service of the Lord before him with our burnt offerings and with our sacrifices and with our peace offerings that your children may not say to our children in time to come, ye have no part in the Lord. Therefore said we that it shall be when they should say to us or to our generations in time to come, 
that we may say again, behold, the pattern of the altar of the Lord, which our fathers made not for burnt offerings nor for sacrifices, but as a witness between us and you. So the whole point of them building that was just as a testimony, as a witness to say, here's why we're doing this. And even in, um, in Esther, the book of Esther, the Jews got their great victory, right? And they had the battle and the people that hated them and wanted to kill them. They, they were able to defeat their enemies and they created a holiday out of it. The days of um, um, Pur Purim. Pur, right? That was the, the day. And, and, and in one place they had two days and the other place they had one day because was, you know, there was two days, I think, given in, uh, at Shushan, the palace in that, in that area. They, they were able to fight off their enemies for two days and everyone else had one day and they, they defeated their enemies. And they would give gifts. They would have feasts. They would do all the things that you celebrate with. And there was nothing wrong with it. Now, and God didn't say they had to do that. They decided to do that. It was a tradition that they kept because they wanted to remember what God did for them, how God had victory over their enemies, and, and that God saw them through. So they say, well, we want our children to always remember this. So we're going we're gonna to always be giving gifts. We're going to be having feasts. It's going to be a time to get together. And it'll be something that's established that we're going to keep for our future generations to not forget what happened. That's what Easter is. It's a tradition. We have a tradition of celebrating Easter here. We always have a potluck after the morning service. That's our tradition. God didn't say we had to do that. The Bible doesn't say that. But it's what we do. There's nothing wrong with it. I think it's a good thing. And we're going to continue to do that. We're going to celebrate with some good fellowship and like-minded believers and, and give thanks to God for his wonderful gift and for his mercy and for the resurrection of Jesus Christ and the blessed hope that we have through the resurrection of Christ. There's nothing wrong with our tradition. And just because some pagan somewhere may have their own potluck right around the same time of year doesn't mean that what we're doing is pagan. We're worshiping the Lord. We love having good fellowship with our spiritual family as well as our physical family. I mean, there's people who get families get together and they celebrate on Easter. It's a good thing to do. Now, my last, I'm going to close out with this. If ever there was a time or a day, though, and don't forget this, because with, our, with, with all of our celebrations, I think this is important, especially the celebrations when it comes to God and you know, like Easter and Christmas specifically. Don't let your traditions get in the way of, of what you're celebrating to begin with. You know, it, it's like um, we, had, we had Christmas on Sunday this year, right? And it's like, well, why should we not come to church because it's Christmas? It's kind of defeating the purpose. Of, you know, like we're celebrating Jesus Christ. Why would we then lift up our tradition above just serving God? And, and come, you know, I mean, it, it just doesn't make any sense. So if there's ever a time or a day to go out and preach the gospel, the gospel, right? What, what is the gospel? The death, the burial, in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, preaching that gospel, that good news of the resurrection of Christ. Hey, he's alive. He paid for your sins. He conquered death and hell. What better day than Easter Sunday? The day we use to celebrate his resurrection. Hey, he's back from the dead. He's alive. You can have eternal life through Jesus. What better day than today? I encourage you to stick around. Stick around. Let's have some food. Let's have some fellowship. Let's enjoy each other. Let, let, let's enjoy the gift that God's given us. Let's go out and, and at least tell one person about that today. Tell someone else. Let's get excited about it. It's good news. As far as I have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for the wonderful gift you've given us, dear Lord. We thank you um, that you're such an amazing God and that... that Nothing can stop you. Death can't hold you, dear Lord. We thank you for coming and paying the ultimate sacrifice for us. God, help us to be stirred up in our spirits today, this afternoon, to um, let other people know about, about the resurrection, about that life, dear Lord, about, the, about eternal life. God, help us to be bold and, and to be able to um, not get too distracted with our own traditions, but that we would still stay focused on doing what's right by you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.